Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. In a busy and rather varied programme today, we'll be hearing from NATO's new man in Afghanistan, from Rwanda's foreign affairs minister, Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, will join us, plus one of the world's best-known, most articulate and good-fun scientists, Robert Winston, will give his views on the dangers of inventions. But first, we move to Somalia, where the country's president, Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed, is trying to get international support for his fragile transitional government. The president has now been in power, if that's the right word, for just over a year and arguably has one of the most difficult and dangerous jobs in the world. He warned this week that terrorism and piracy in Somalia threaten death and destruction far beyond its borders. Well, I met him in London and I wanted to know what he was thinking about there, which countries he would think would be most affected by the internal chaos in his country. It has already reached beyond our borders. Pirates hijack ships from distant places. Terrorists have also reached many areas such as Yemen. You're also aware that terrorists became able to repatriate many people who live in Europe and America to Somalia and train them. Therefore, it's possible that these trained terrorists may be sent back to where they came from. And in terms of the Somali government, you are waging, obviously, a war, really, with al-Shabaab. And uh, al-Shabaab recently pledged its support to al-Qaeda. Do you see them as now as one and the same thing or still separate? They are one and the same. It's apparent from their statements. Their leaders are members of the main al-Qaeda organization. All of their leaders came from Afghanistan, where they were trained and participated in fighting alongside al-Qaeda. There are high-ranking al-Qaeda officials and soldiers who came from abroad who are currently fighting inside Somalia. How big a force is, in fact, al-Qaeda? Do you know how many, how many actual sort of al-Qaeda people uh, militants are there in your country now, in Somalia? How many from Al-Qaeda? Um, Let us divide them into two, the internal Al-Qaeda and those who came from abroad. The numbers of internal Al-Qaeda is unlimited because their training is continuous. As for those who came from overseas, the estimate is between 800 and 1,200 people. Now there, are, there is talk at the moment um, about the fact that you are going to organize a major offensive to try and drive al-Shabaab out of um, Mogadishu. Um, how much help do you think you can get from the United States in this? Um, would you welcome the United States uh, doing airstrikes on your behalf? The government has a responsibility to restore peace, law and order. Our forces are able to achieve that. However, we welcome any help that comes from the international community, be it the United States or elsewhere. Would you also welcome American troops in, on the land, on the ground in Somalia too? American forces. I believe that government troops are sufficient to do the job. And um, Al Shabaab spokesman speaking on Al Jazeera said that uh, when when told about the possibility of Americans getting involved in airstrikes, maybe being involved on the ground and so on, um, this was what the guy from. Uh, Al Shabab said, he said, if they come to Somalia, they need to know that those that fought them in 1993 and dragged, and dragged their bodies in the streets of Mogadishu are still present and ready to drag their bodies again. Do you think they're that strong that they could do that, the, the Al Shabab rebels? Al Shabab, Manta, Dr. Somalia. 
Not at all. Al-Shabaab are despised by the Somali public. They've caused many problems for civilians. The Somali people are today thinking of peace and statehood, and they'll support anyone who works towards that goal. And what do you think about the situation now? How do you view Ethiopia, uh, a country that ousted you from government, had come in as theoretically as friends? Um, do you think today of the country of Ethiopia as a friend, an enemy, or half and half? Ethiopia is our neighbor, and we have no choice but to live together side by side. It's better to live together in peace rather than in conflict. That is our choice. Situations may change, but I can say that in the current situation, I see them as a friend. As a friend. We saw, we saw in um, the newspapers and so on and on television that France had captured... 35 pirates over the weekend. Do you think this is a sign that the rest of the world is more getting more involved in helping you? Is this a, a promising change? Very much so, because the pirates are causing problems for the Somali people, the government and the world at large. And a united front against them is something important which we welcome. What about the fact that there are now, Mr. President, um, they say more than 130 um, people who are being held hostage by pirates off the coast or in Somalia. Uh, 130. Um, including, of course, the British couple, uh, Paul and Rachel Chandler. Um, is there any news of them, for instance? First of all, we're very sad about these deplorable acts perpetrated against innocent people, such as the British couple who are elderly people. The Somali government and the Somali people are very sorry about their abduction, and tremendous efforts have been made to secure their release. These efforts continue, and we know that they are in good health. We're very hopeful that they will regain their freedom. Of course, the situation for you is in terms of security and so on, as president of Somalia, uh, in terms of security is, is very difficult, isn't it? Because four government ministers, I think, have been murdered and so on. Um, do you expect there to be attempts on your life too? Attempts against my life are a regular occurrence. There have been five murdered ministers, not four. All were very important and active ministers. The Somali government and people are determined to ensure that their blood was not spilt in vain and that their sacrifice will help in bringing peace and stability to Somalia and also free the country from these terrorist groups. Would you say that you, you have the hope that before you leave office you can safely walk through the streets of Mogadishu, just walking everywhere in Mogadishu? Do you think the day when you can do that will ever dawn? Very much so, because you're aware about the problems that used to happen in Somalia and the changes which took place in 2006. No one expected that Mogadishu could be pacified. Today, at a time when the Somali people are more aware and the Somali government is trying hard to secure peace and the international community is supportive, I believe that we can succeed. You have one of the most difficult jobs in the world and naturally we wish you well. Coming up in a moment, NATO's new man in Afghanistan and Helen Clark, until recently the Prime Minister of New Zealand and now with an even bigger job. Welcome back, welcome back. On the 13th of February, NATO launched Operation Mosharak in Afghanistan. It's one of the largest offences since the war began in 2001. 15,000 Afghan and International Security Force, ISAF, troops are working together to try and end the Taliban's occupation, particularly of the Helmand province in South Afghanistan. If and when the area is cleared of Taliban fighters, it's hoped that civilians will return and bring peace and stability to the region again. Mark Sedwell, 
NATO's newly appointed civilian representative in Afghanistan will particularly come into his own then. He joins me now. Mark, this is a major, a major assignment that you've got now. Um, you've been talking about, obviously, about the Taliban and so on. H how many do you think we have to face up to in Afghanistan at the moment in terms of either good Taliban or bad Taliban? The numbers are difficult to know. We think that something between 25 and 30,000 fighters altogether, but probably about three quarters of those fight within a few miles of where they're born and where their families live. And so they're, it's not really good or bad, but they're Taliban who we think in the end can be relatively straightforwardly reintegrated into their communities if the conditions are right. In terms of the, those actual, the good Taliban and the bad Taliban, as it were, the 25,000 or the 2,000, how do you tell which is which? Well, of course, we don't in the end. Their own communities will work that out. And, and this is why I think it, it is un important we understand that most of them are, are local. And therefore, in a sense, it's a series of local insurgencies rather than one big single insurgency, although they all follow a certain amount of command and control from uh, the core Taliban, you know, most of whom are in, uh, are in Pakistan. And their own communities will, re will reintegrate them and, and decide that they don't want their sons fighting anymore. The core Taliban, the leadership, are generally pretty well known and uh, they're floating around within Pakistan um, and of course what we're seeing is gradually ISI the Pakistani intelligence service is getting more of a grip on that as, as they have in the past few weeks with all these arrests and in terms of President Karzai I mean who is who has become increasingly a controversial figure um, Peter Galbraith the uh, deputy UN representative previous one in uh, in Afghanistan said this he was on with us here uh, a couple of weeks ago and he, uh, he was to say he was firm is putting it mildly really but let's just take a look at that uh. and Karzai uh, is now he may not be forced out of office but his credibility around the world is shot his credibility in his own country is shot among large segments of the population that's a core part of the problem he's seen as illegitimate uh, and the crisis has simply gotten worse um, how do you sum up Hamid Karzai. I mean, is it possible that all this corruption went on without his knowledge? I think he's as much a prisoner of the system uh, at which he's the top as he is in any sense the architect of it. Corruption is endemic in Afghanistan. It's a huge problem and it largely relates to the capability of government. And if you look in places like Helmand and Kandahar and so on, actually it's, it's not so much corruption but the abuse of power by local warlords who capture the institutions of the state and pervert them for their own end so they serve them and not the people and that's really the problem and it's easy for us to personalize it and say President Karzai must do this he must do that and so on but it's bigger than one man's capability to deal with so yes he knows it's a problem and he acknowledges it's a problem uh, but he needs an awful lot of help to tackle it do you think he's corrupt himself no um, genuinely I don't I mean I, you know, I I've never seen any evidence or indeed intelligence to suggest that he is and he he's personally quite a simple man he's lived that way for for much of his life uh, and he doesn't, uh, you know, unlike some leaders, he doesn't seem to be attracted by the trappings of power. He's interested uh, in actually the exercise of power. And uh, he is, as we, as we speak, he's in uh, Islamabad um, talking, talking there um, with Mr. Jalani, the, the Prime Minister. And they, he qu quoted these words. He said, we're discussing fundamentally changed policy approach towards stability in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, what does that mean in uh, non-diplomatic language? Well, it's, of course, I don't exactly know the content of the talks yet, but I think what we, what we have to hope it means is that Pakistan and Afghanistan recognize they have a shared threat from Islamic extremism, uh, which flows backwards and forwards across that border, and, and they each have problems that are located in the other, and that therefore they need to take a shared approach to it. Let's hope that what this means is, is exactly that. It's a shared threat, and they need to take a shared approach. And, and in terms of the the future of how long we're going to be there and so on. We're going to need soldiers there for how long? Uh, the whole NATO force, as it were, because there's, what, 44 countries represented, I think. That's there. right. How many of them have, have got actual soldiers fighting and how many are helping in other ways? Um, all of them have soldiers there and, and many of them are doing training roles and mentoring roles and probably the, ma the majority are doing that. Although that isn't entirely safe in many cases because we're now trying to get NATO forces alongside Afghan forces out on the ground. But it's a relatively small number, probably 10 or 12 countries of the, of the bigger contributors there who really have forces sort of out in danger on a daily basis. And of course it tends to be those in the south 
the Americans, the British, the Canadians, several others, um, where the insurgency it is, is at its strongest, who face the highest number of casualties. Actually, the Dutch, um, who are in Uruzgan, who face proportionately the highest number of casualties of, uh, of all of the coalition forces. And they're thinking of withdrawing, aren't they, the Dutch? They decided to do so. This is a decision they made some time ago. And, of course, they've been in the fight for a long time, and it's taken, it's taken a toll. And it, you know, we mustn't forget that as we, uh, as we remember the amount of uh, effort they've put in. But most other countries are actually increasing forces and increasing their commitment to Afghanistan at this stage. And in terms of ma magic word peace, I mean, when is it realistic to think that Af Afghanistan might have peace or never total peace, always slightly troubled? I think it's likelier that it will be troubled, although we shouldn't rule out the prospects of peace. And, and as you asked me a moment ago, if Afghanistan and Pakistan can take a genuinely shared approach, then I think there is the real prospect of peace. But more likely, Afghanistan, three to five years from now, will still have pockets of insurgency. There will still be levels of violence relating to tribal disputes, land disputes, that uh, you know, in, in the West we would find extremely difficult to, uh, to understand. But with, within the Afghan context, uh, wouldn't threaten the integrity of the state. And therefore, the country would, as many other poor countries, be on the road to development. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Mr. David, very thank good you. to have you with us. Thank, thank you. you. In the face of food and fuel crises, the global recession, global warming and devastating natural disasters, what chance for the Millennium Development Goals, ambitious targets set up 10 years ago to tackle poverty and hunger and improve education and health care by 2015? Getting closer. The former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark, is the head of the UN Development Programme. Her job is to help developing countries achieve the Millennium Goals. Not to be confused with World Cup goals, which will come up in a short period of time, but welcome, welcome back. Thank you. Um, of, the, of the eight goals, I mean, they're all important, but are there three that are more urgent than the others, for instance? Absolutely, and they're all to do with women, because where the goals lag the most is where women's needs and status gets rather low priority. So if we're talking empowering women, that's a very important goal. The importance of improving maternal health, which is in a, a sad state in many parts of the world. And then the issue of equal access for women and girls to education. But those are the big three where if we made progress, we'd have ripple effects right through the others. Yes, because, I mean, this week uh, The Economist produced that uh, cover called Gendercide um, because of, in fact, the fact of the number of babies female babies that are aborted or killed or whatever around the world. Uh, that is a pressing problem in parts of the world, yes? not it, it is, and it's getting to quite a pronounced demographic imbalance in countries where there is yeah. uh, selective abortion against yes, female it, In some places fetuses. it's hit 124 boys to every 100 girls, hasn't it? Uh, that's right, and uh, in the end the boys are going to want in the most uh, part, to marry someone, have a partner, and the partners aren't going to be there for a number of them. Yeah. So what do you do about that? Well, I think, I think it's all about supporting women in countries to make the changes that they seek. We've just released a very large report on gender in the Asia-Pacific, and it, it goes into you know, so, some of the real difficulties women face, but then says if we empower in the economy, if we empower in politics, uh, if we enforce and uphold and, and make sure there are uh, good legal rights, we can make a very big difference. What about the uh, cutting poverty by half? That's the most people would pick on that as one, certainly one of the top three, if not the top uh, priority. Cutting poverty in half, that's a huge task, isn't it? Is it actually possible by 2015? On a global level, yes it is. It, it m almost certainly will be achieved, but that's largely because China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty since 1990. It's been the most incredible move out of poverty that humankind has ever seen. However, if we took the Chinese figures out of the equation and looked at the rest, uh, no, a lot of countries haven't made as much progress. So that's really one to focus on for, for the, the rest of the developing world. One of the other problems with aid, of course, came up uh, in this report this week that said that there was in, in, in Somalia, we were talking to the president of Somalia just uh, in the first part of this program, but the, a half of all food sent to Somalia is stolen, says UN report. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it, that even when you get something to deal with hunger, 
it can be waylaid on the way to its target. Well, for sure, that's one of the most difficult areas for, say, World Food Programme to operate in. But uh, goodness me, they do their best. There's a lot of people who wouldn't have made it through pretty terrible times in Somalia without the World Food Programme being prepared to put its workers' lives on the line to get food uh, out there. Uh, for sure, as that report says, and not all of the food will have gone where it was intended, but an awful lot has. And when you said one of the reasons that the poverty uh, target will be met is the effects of China and so on. What, if, what effects on what you're doing to, in a way, put it mildly, save the world, um, that uh, what effect has the credit crunch had? Does it make things more difficult to it, hit it, the targets? It, it's made it tougher, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, t take, for example, the, the series of crises which have run together, because before the recession you had the food price crisis, and that's never really gone away. The prices are pretty high. You had a fuel price spike, and then you have these incredible natural disasters, whether it's earthquake, the climate-related ones, tsunami, there's been devastation out there. It's been, been catastrophic. So put a lot of those things together, a number of countries are very badly affected. And if you look at the chronically hunger, hungry numbers, that's gone over a billion now, uh, up probably 130 million on what it was two years ago. A chronically hungry? Chronically hungry. How is that defined? People who literally have no food? I mean, is it, or? Who just, just go without anything remotely like what's necessary to sustain uh, life at a healthy level leads to very significant malnutrition among uh, children and people whose, whose lives are just blighted by never having enough to eat. Yes, obviously you've been in touch with mm. what's going on in the world as, as mm. Prime Minister of New Zealand, but as you look at what you're responsible for now, mm. um, I mean, has the added knowledge you've got now of the situation around the world and the countries that you perhaps hadn't visited before, I mean, are things getting better or do you do you end up despairing sometimes? No, I, I'm an optimist, or, or I wouldn't take a job like this no. in the middle of a whole lot of crises. Mm -hmm. And the, the truth is, David, there's been a lot of progress. And if we could now take the success stories, and, and there are so many of them of countries, including the poorest countries, who really have brought down their infant death rate, really have got more children into school, we can take those lessons, accelerate from what we know has worked, uh, spread that word and experience. I'm absolutely convinced we can meet these goals, but it's going to take a lot of focus. In a way, that the goals, wonderful as they are, were a set of outcomes, but probably from the beginning, they lacked a clear strategy to reach them, because you just don't pull a lever and have 100% of all children in school, uh, or the other very wonderful outcomes there are. You have to have a strategy. There has to be growth, but it needs to be inclusive needs to be green in the 21st century as well. So, so we really have to work on the basis of what we know has succeeded elsewhere. And if, if we really focus, we, we could meet those goals. Great to have you with us. Thank you. See you again soon, I hope. Mm. Helen Clark there. After the break, Robert Winston, one of the world's top medical scientists and one of the most articulate to boot, uh, questions whether humans are too clever for their own good. Welcome back, welcome back. Lord Robert Winston is one of the world's most respected scientists and a pioneer in reproductive medicine. In his latest book, which we've got right here, called Bad Ideas and the Resting History of Our Inventions, he talks about the dangers of putting too much faith in new technology to solve the world's problems. From climate change to feeding the starving, science is often looked to for answers to save the planet and its people. But is the right, right approach of the world taking to the whole question of science and scientific discoveries? He's here right now. Robert, what you say is that all the, even the good ideas, the good inventions, have a bad side. And so, to quote one example here, there, there exists the potential also for our undoing in some of these ideas. Now, can you give us a couple of examples of well, undoing? I think the issue partly is that... Um, when an invention is first launched, nobody fully understands its real value. A classic example would have been the laser. It's 50 years since the invention of the laser. Nobody for a moment thought that the laser might be useful for making a CD machine to play music or to measure the genome by, because the laser is used to look at the DNA in, the, in, in a DNA sequencer or to measure the distance to the moon. And so all that technology was completely unthought of. Equally, of course, 
the downside of the laser, the fact that it's a really powerful uh, weapon for exploring nuclear technology, and in fact that's how it's being used in the s some parts of the United States at the moment, in California, um, was never envisaged either. So I think um, all technologies have but a downside. Just that, yeah, what, what is it exactly? Because all the things you just added there are all good news, aren't they? Well, I mean, the nuclear weapons the are op op open to argument. But of course, absolutely. I mean, most inventions, nearly all inventions, are good. And, but we don't understand where the impact's going to be. So if you, if you look through, I mean, the first big technology was agri agriculture. Agriculture was about 11,000 years ago, mostly in the Fertile Crescent. Um, once we started agriculture, we lived shorter lives. We had more disease, more infection, more arthritis, because we were grinding corn. We got bad teeth. We reduced genetic diversity. We caused climate change, or we started to cause climate change. And we were much more subject to battle and warfare, because, of course, once humans had settled, there would be disputes over land. A couple here that, well, one here that interests me very much indeed. Anti, antibiotics can both kill and cure. Yes, How very, very good kill? example, I think. I mean, uh, and also, of course, not envisaged at the time. When Alexander Fleming observed the mold in his laboratory on the windowsill, he never thought for a moment he was going to have something which would save millions of lives. But nobody could have envisaged, of course, that the use of antibiotics would cause MRSA, uh, bacteria which are completely impervious to modern antibiotics. And also, of course, antibiotics have also caused the huge increase in asthma in young children because it's changed our immune system. But drawing up the credit and debit balance, you'd still, would you still give antibiotics a credit balance? Of course. I'd, all these technologies would be in a credit balance. I mean, my view is not a pessimistic one. My view is a very optimistic one. I think that what I'm saying in the book is that uh, every technology we invent is on the whole a good thing. I'd rather live now in 2010 than 1910 or 1810 or whenever. But the problem is that our technologies are increasingly powerful and therefore the downside is increasingly powerful. And therefore we need to recognize that and to try, find, try to find ways for, to accommodate society generally around the world. I mean, climate change is a very, very good example. Yeah. Well, what, but what in your area, in an area of uh, reproductive and genetics and so on, yes, is that I would say so. susceptible to the same thing I that there are so major David. negatives as well as there are po positives? I, I would say there are because um, first of all, there's quite a lot of evidence that IVF is being used unnecessarily and women are being exploited financially. But I also think that it's avoiding much simpler treatments, which will be less expensive and which are now being almost disused in consequence. The other issue, of course, is the past prospect using the sort of technology that we developed of human genetic engineering, something which is a bit scary. I mean, the idea that we might try and improve the human genes, um, modify intelligence, modify strength, change the nature of humanity, could mean that our respect for human life would also change because somebody who's superhuman would have a different view of being human, and that in the future could be a massive threat, I think, to, what about, to us. What about something like stem cell technology and so on? Thinking it not, not, yes. not for just well, I fetuses, think, but I think stem cell, adult. It's a really interesting question. Uh, it's a really interesting question. I think the issue for stem cell technology is really two kinds. One, of course, is that stem cells may function for a a while inside the body perfectly and the organ gets cured but then they revert to a different cell type and one of the real backlashes may well be the development of cancers and I think there's lots of evidence to suggest that stem cells coming from embryonic cells particularly but maybe from any kind of cell um, might actually lead to unexpected cancer um, and I think that that's a problem that we haven't yet come to deal with um, I think it's difficult to predict because, of course, scientists are no better at predicting than anybody else. And should, should because of some of these things, science in general be reorganized in the sense that, it, that it's regulated more or should it be regulated less because intellectual fantasies and, mm. and, and things can only succeed in a free world? That's a great question. I mean, I think that, I don't think regulation works, frankly. Uh, I think what the prospect has to be is to be much better 
literate in science, literacy in science. We need to have more science education. And I think the public has to be taken much more on board. I don't really entirely trust governments either, because governments on the whole, even democratic ones, haven't used science very wisely. We've seen that in this country, in Britain, but it happens in America, it happens all over the world too. And so I think there has to be a greater recognition of the public responsibility for what we do. And I think that's partly what, why the book is written, really. Yeah. And uh, in fact, most of these problems are absolutely international, aren't they? They're, they're more and more. Yeah. Um, because, of course, one of the technologies is the Internet. And the Internet is a, is a wonderful technology because it democratizes ideas, it spreads science, it spreads news, it spreads all sorts of valuable things. But the Internet is a very good example of a technology that has a downside. It can spread sedition, it can spread uh, violence, it can spread pornography. There are a whole range of things, and it's very difficult to regulate. Uh, I mean, you mentioned the issue of regulation. On the whole, regulation is a pretty blunt weapon in, 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 in government. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's always a joy to talk to you, Robert. The, you refer, here you are with all these great ideas from improving the world and so on. Why do you sometimes refer to your dark side? What's <laughs> that? <laughs> well, I think, I think I've got a dark side. Um, I think it's very easy to be pumped up to be better than you are or more, more than you are. Uh, and I'm well aware of the deficiencies um, which I've got, which are pretty strong. <laughs> well, I th well, we haven't seen any of them today, anyway. <laughs> thank you very much, Robert. David, thank Always you. a joy to have you with us. Robert Winston there. After the break, we're going to meet an extraordinary woman. She's Foreign Affairs Minister of Rwanda, but she lost 12 members of her family during the Rwandan genocide. So she speaks with authority. Welcome back, welcome back. After three years of severed diplomatic relations, France and Rwanda are trying to build bridges. The standoff happened when a French judge accused Rwanda's president, he's in fact the president now, President Kagame, of being involved in the shooting down of a plane carrying a former president, juvenile Habi Arimana. It was an incident that uh, sparked, helped to spark certainly, the 1994 genocide in which up to a million people died, some say 1.1 million. Now in a new twist, Agatha Habi Arimana, the former president's widow, who is wanted in Rwanda on suspicion of helping to launch the massacres, helping to launch them, that was what she was accused of. Um, she's been arrested in France by France. Earlier I asked Louise Mushi Kiwabo, Rwanda's foreign affairs minister, what she wants to happen now, what should happen now to Mrs. Habi Arimana? Mrs. Habi Arimana is, um, from all the documentation that exists on the genocide, uh, somebody who's been very close to the genocidal enterprise. She has been now living in France for many years. Uh, the government of Rwanda has uh, requested her extradition. She was in fact arrested on a warrant by the Rwandan prosecutorial authorities, which is a very good thing. And of course we would like her uh, extradited and tried in Rwanda uh, near uh, the scene of her crime. Uh, but uh, whether she's tried in France or Rwanda, to, to many Rwandans doesn't matter as long as justice is served. Yes, it would be difficult, I mean, the, with the memories and so on, it would be difficult to get a fair, a fair trial with an unbiased jury in Rwanda. I mean, it, it would, I'm sure her lawyers would argue that, wouldn't they? But she's not the only uh, genocide suspect uh, that would be tried in Rwanda. Rwanda has tried uh, thousands of, of, of citizens who were involved in the genocide. Um, it, is, it is critical that um, uh, f for those who suffered from the genocide, they get to really see uh, uh, these trials. The truth, international truth and reconciliation. Sure, perhaps. it's part of the reconciliation process. And we realize that the masterminds of the genocide uh, have been um, those that were able uh, to, to face trial. 
uh, this has all happened away from Rwanda and away from the victims. So it would be a very good thing uh, for, for her to be, to be tried in Rwanda. There are many Rwandans that have been tried since 1994 um, and tried fairly. This situation, of course, is we talk of in the abstract term genocide, but I mean you and your, your family were victims of this genocide, weren't they? I mean, how many of your family, close family, died? My family um, was living in Rwanda in 1994. I was living in the United States at that time. Um, one of my brothers was um, in the pro-democracy movement. Uh, he was head of the Liberal Party of Rwanda. Um, he, he was killed uh, along with uh, other family members. So at least half of, of, of my family was killed uh, during the Twelve genocide. Or, Twelve or more, yes. Twelve or more, yes. Mm. Have you been able to, in the years between, forgive the people who did that? Or is that impossible? Uh, forgiveness is complicated business. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it comes to, um, to, to genocide, because uh, we Rwandans uh, have been taught and we grew up with uh, a set of values, including um, the fact that life is sacred and that um, thou shalt love your neighbor. Yes and that uh, the community should look after um, its, its, its members and that um, uh, women, for example, who uh, are a major component of our society are the protectors and the givers of life. Uh, these values were shattered by, by the genocide. Uh, I think forgiveness is a personal thing. Um, I, I personally uh, want to understand and to know uh, before I even think of forgiving or, or even having uh, the, the uh, killers of my family uh, prosecuted. I, I just want to understand. Um, and I think uh, forgiveness in this case is a personal journey. Uh, most people would forgive uh, so that they can move on with their own business, but it's not easy. Um, there's an election coming up, isn't there? Um, do you think President Kagame will prevail? You hope he does, obviously, because you're, you're his foreign minister. Yes, yes. Uh, I think he so will. So you're slightly biased, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try not to be biased. Uh, <laughs> uh, President Kagame is, is, is a man who's um, um, stirred uh, the country uh, from extinction basically. His record is excellent. Uh, I don't think people realize what it took uh, to bring Rwanda from the, the death and, and, and desolation of 1994 to where Rwanda is today in 2010. Uh, he's got a very strong record. He's a man who's um, not just brought back uh, normalcy in the country, has uh, done a very good job uh, making uh, Rwandans uh, live together again, but, but also grown the economy, uh, brought uh, about a high level of justice under very difficult circumstances, and obviously placed uh, Rwanda back uh, on the world map. So I, I have no doubt that uh, many Rwandans have seen this. and, and, and um, will respond with their vote. One other thing I was going to say, but is it true, as people write, that you, in order to try and bind up the wounds from 1994 and so on, that, that you are trying to, to urge people to talk not about Tutsis and Hutus, but just about Rwandans? Is that an attempt to heal the wounds, the later wounds? We, um, in Rwanda, figured that in order to move on, uh, we should not use uh, the Tutsi and Hutu labels uh, to harm one another. It's not a crime uh, to use the words and to call each other Hutu or Tutsi. Uh, but w we, we figured that we have much more in common as, as, as a people. We have the same language. Uh, all Rwandans speak one language. We have 
the same culture, the same rituals, uh, we share the same religions. And using these two words to divide and separate to the point where um, it became easy to brainwash the average person into killing their neighbor is something we want to move far away from. Right, right. But it's all right for people to be proud to be a Tutsi or a Absolutely. I, I don't think uh, there is anything wrong with people wanting to define or identify themselves. It is wrong to use one's identity to harm their neighbor. And that's, that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Louise, Thank for being with us. Thank we you very much. We hope to see much. you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Now, imagine driving along the motorway at 70 miles per hour and then putting your car suddenly into reverse. This is what happened to the global economy, according to the novelist John Lanchester in his new book, Whoops! Everyone owes everyone and no one can pay. A layman's guide to the crisis. So where did it all go wrong? John is with me right now to talk about whoops and such tragedies. Um, what was the key reason it happened when it did? in 2008 and so on. But I think the key thing is that the, the bankers thought they, they, they genuinely believed they'd invented a wholly new way of managing risk. Um, That's the equivalent of alchemists thinking that you had magic machines that would turn anything into gold. And they thought they'd engineered away risk with these new financial instruments. And the net effect of that was spreading these huge amounts of risk all through the financial system so that when um, a panic happened, it hit globally uh, all at once. And I mean, was it more or less inevitable uh, with the huge growth of the amount of money circulating and so on? I, thi I think it starts to look inevitable. Once you bear in mind we had long-term capital management blew up in 1998, that would have been a trillion dollar hole. Um, the dot-com crash, the, which is the biggest destruction of capital the world had ever seen, and then Enron, which was you know, the biggest systematic fraud the world had ever seen. I think you have to conclude that these events are getting bigger and they're getting closer together. I think the, the speed and the fluidity with which capital move, moves around the world just it do does increase the kind of risks that are being taken. And so who do you think are the villains, really, of the piece? I mean, John Langeston names those guilty men. Who are they? Well, I think greed, stupidity, governments and banks. I think there's plenty enough blame to go around. Um, I think that the, the, the bankers did um, were guilty of terrible hubris and of a kind of clever stupidity. These instruments were so brilliant that they forgot to realize that they didn't really make sense. But the regulators and politicians were also c very, very complicit and um, asleep at the wheel. Um, it, it couldn't have happened without um, systematic deregulation and unregulation, and that's what the politicians gave the bankers. And in terms of the future, is this something, we know we've got years to uh, deal with the after, aftermath and after effects of this thing. And when governments are close to elections, as they are in some areas, uh, they play that down. But we know that's going to go on for quite, quite a time. But is there a danger of a similar crash, a similar credit crunch hitting the world? Or is, is the future, apart from getting rid of the problems from the last one, clear it's going to be all right or is it do you think fragile and it could happen again well I, I see absolutely no reason why it won't happen again given that the architecture isn't fixed um, uh, you know th there isn't a single big idea to reduce risk we, it's like um, the Lilliputians tying down Gulliver we need lots of little ropes and, and, and I don't see the mechanisms remember you know it's 18 months ago now it was the autumn of 2008 and there's been an amazing amount of talk, but where are the regulatory instruments? Where are the new laws? Um, and I, I, I'm starting to fear that the amount of talk is in exact inverse proportion to what's actually being done. And that does create the chance of it And again. so having written the book and seen these things and the danger of it happening again, what has it persuaded you to do with your savings, with your money? What are you going to do with it um, to protect it? Well, I, I, I don't, I'm not clever enough to do anything other than just, you know, stick it in passive funds and leave it there. I, I, I do believe that um, you can't, you know, I'd love to be Warren Buffett, but I'm not. And uh, failing to, in the absence of being Warren Buffett, I think it's very difficult to beat the market. Yeah, well, that's an, that's an interesting thought. Well, if you decide to go into action to try and top Warren Buffett, that would be a good subject for another book, really. Yeah, a good way of losing a lot of money, too. Yes, that's true, too. Yes, thanks very much indeed, John. Very, very good to have you with us. And that's it, I'm afraid, for this week. I hope you found some... Uh
potential happy endings in what we've just been talking about. But anyway, join us again in seven days' time for another Frost Over the World. <laughs>